<laughs> yep, that's it. <sighs> nice and comfortable. Let's, uh, let's get started. Tell us about yourself. So my name's Terry Price. I am 35 years old, literally just turned 35, in fact. And I'm from a small village called Holbridge, which is in Essex in England, in the United Kingdom. How did scootering become an addiction for you? So I grew up in Holbridge, which is a tiny, tiny little village, but they just so happened to have a skate park there. And it wasn't a very good skate park, I'll be honest, but it, it helped me kickstart my scooter riding career. It was a tiny little jump box, I think about three feet high and a, and a small spine about four foot high. But I loved it there. I spent most days there riding my scooter. I picked up a scooter back in 1999 when folding scooters were first ever invented. I got one for my 11th birthday after begging my mum for a scooter. And as soon as I got that scooter, I headed straight down to the skate park to, to try it out. And I just got addicted from there on. I loved it. It just felt so, so natural to me. You know, I tried BMX riding, it was like huge BMX and it just didn't feel right. I tried inline skating, skateboarding, but scooters felt perfect. And I know why kids love scooter riding now because I've had that exact experience before and scooters are just awesome. They're really good fun. And here I am to this day, still riding scooters. Who is Terry outside of scooter riding? So obviously scooter riding is a huge, huge part of my life and I can't deny that. It's, it's been a massive part of my life for the last 24 years and I'm sure it's going to be a part of my life for the rest of my life to be honest. It's, it's crazy how a sport can become you but I am more than just what you see on your social media feed. I, I am my own individual character and yeah, I, I love my family. I love my friends. I love spending time with family. You know, they're really important to me, but I love exploring. I love getting out in nature, out in mountains, getting out and with my dog as well. I love my dog so much and I'm just a normal guy, really. I, I like normal things and Luckily, scooter riding has really complemented them things because with scooter riding, I've traveled all over and that just so happens to be something I love doing on a personal level as well. So I'm not necessarily traveling all the time with my scooter. I'll have my scooter and I'll use my scooter for work. But I do like to have a separate side as well where I won't take my scooter and maybe I'll go on a mountain bike and ride in the hills and have fun that way. How did family and friends contribute to your journey? Well, without family, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So all credit to my mum and my dad, of course. You know, they, they, uh, they supported me through times where I would be breaking scooters every two weeks, essentially because it'd be folding scooters. They weren't made for tricks. I would snap these folding scooters and every two weeks or so. And so I'd go and my dad would buy me a new scooter. And then two weeks later, I'd snap it. And then my mum would buy me a new scooter. And then my dad would buy me a scooter and then mum and dad and then mum and then dad. And it was like that right up until 2010, because for the first 11 years that I rode, I was on folding scooters and there were no such thing as stunt scooters. And so without my family support through them times, I wouldn't have become the professional rider that I am now. And obviously you asked about friends as well. You know, friends, I've, I've, I've created so many friends throughout the community of scooter riding. So many friends that have become a huge part of my life and then they maybe stopped riding, but I still see them as such a good friend to this day because you meet so many amazing people in the skate park and in the scooter riding community that that 
friendship will transcend the sport of scooter riding and it's lovely really because I've got some really really close friends from the sport of scooter riding and it's, it's great really I've got hundreds of friends just from this sport it's a wonderful sport being one of the first scooter riders in skate parks did you face any fears of non-acceptance I mean, yes is the answer to that. I mean, I was bullied at the skate park when I was young. I'd go to the skate park and just get bullied for riding a scooter. And I'm sure a lot of people watching this have probably experienced the same thing as well. It's it. Scooter riding was never the cool sport. And I put cool in parenthesis because it's an awesome sport. But it wasn't one of the cool mainstream sports and... A lot of skateboarders, BMXers, inline skaters, they, they didn't like what we were doing. We were coming in and riding in at their skate parks and it was like the new kid on the block and it wasn't instantly accepted. We're still fighting for acceptance to this day in a lot of ways. And so it was, it was tough, you know, I was a kid and I would face a lot of tough situations at the skate park but it was them it was it was the the resilience and the perseverance and the hard hard work and not and blocking out what everyone else was saying to me and focusing on what i loved that helped shape the character that i am to this day and yeah i, I wouldn't change a thing even though it was hard it's it's, you know, I am me because of that. Tell us about the early days in your scooter career. So, I mean, I started out on folding scooters for the first decade of riding. And I would just ride on curbs and just doing bunny hops off curbs and learning all sorts of tricks on the floor and then went to the skate park and learn basic tricks you know i just started out like any, anyone else you know just no footers and x ups and inspiration from other sports because back then there wasn't scooter riding it didn't exist there weren't any pro riders to look up to i was one of the first ever pro riders in the sport and so i took a lot of my influence from bmx and so I, a lot of my riding style is influenced by bmx and you see a lot of other riders like Jazzy Carter, for example, with a lot of influence from skateboarding. And I think us early scooter riders have, have had that. Whereas scooter riders nowadays take influence from other scooter riders. So they learn scooter tricks based on of the scooter riders that they love to watch. And um, I... For the first 10 years of my riding, I was nobody, really, realistically. By, by 2005, I started to really like make a name for myself in the scooter, in, scooter community. I won the European Championships and in 2007, what was the World Championships, I won that, but you know, they're more official nowadays. Um, it took a long time for anything to happen you know i i'd been riding for 11 years before i met any of the people from mad gear and before i joined mad gear and so there was a huge part of my journey before then you know i was, I was sponsored by micro extreme for a long time who were you know they were there at the start and they weren't stunt scooters, but they were folding scooters with stuff bolted onto them to make them a bit stronger. And I mean, God, I broke a lot of them scooters. But again, that, that's what helped shape the rider I am to this day. And I find it hilarious that kids complain about their scooters now. Like that, they'll be like too heavy or too light, or you know, it's not it's not weighted right. Or no, I don't like that, and I don't like that. And it's like. You should have seen what I rode back in the day. Like I would have rode anything. I did my first ever flare, and the first flare on a scooter, on a plastic folding scooter. 
It gives you an idea of what the start of my scoot riding career looked like. And I wouldn't change it for the world. Honestly, some of the, some of the best stories have come from that era. How did Mad Gear become part of your scootering career? I've been riding scooters now for 24 years and I've been with Mad Gear for 13 and a half years as of recording right now. So I've been with Mad Gear for more than half of my scooter riding career and needless to say Mad Gear has helped support me, it's helped shape what I am to this day and more than anything just taken me on a journey of incredible memories and yeah I went from a regular team rider worked my way right up to team manager and working for Mad Gear to then going off and doing my own thing with um, lots of different avenues and now I do scooter coaching but I still ride for Mad Gear which is awesome because our relationship over the years has, has changed in lots of different ways, but one thing hasn't changed, and that is the unwavering support from Mad Gear, which is awesome. And that's why I've got a lot of love for that company, and you guys should too. Tell us about the Mad Gear events at Rampwork Skate Park. I mean, them days were crazy because we would turn up at the skate park and there would literally be like 800 kids lining up at the door for the mad gear scooter nights and because ramp works they didn't open their doors to scooters straight away they were one of the first skate parks to support scooter riding you know shout out to ramp works but they would do specific scooter nights where scooter riders could come and ride ramp works and on top of that mad gear would come and put on a show and sign autographs and make it an amazing experience for everyone involved. And to this day, it was just, it was just insane what I experienced at them nights because, you know, it's as close as you'll get to being a celebrity. There was nothing more than that experience. You know, kids just shouting and screaming your name and, and just wanting to come up and meet you and get your autograph and see you ride or see you fall over in my case and it was it was awesome and and soon after that ramp works obviously saw the potential of scooter riding in skate parks and they opened their doors fully to to scooters and then obviously unfortunately the the scooter only nights went but it was in return for scooters being able to ride ramp works at all times, which was great. Tell us about some of the highlight tricks you've done in your time riding. Uh, one of the first world firsts that I did was the flare on a scooter. Um, and I, I, it's a funny story really, because I wanted to backflip, but I learned to flare before I learned to backflip. Now that is very backwards. No one does that. They learn to backflip first, then they learn to flare. For anyone who doesn't know, a flare is a flip air. And basically, because I would go on my trampoline, I'd do backflips on my trampoline, just on my feet, and I'd imagine myself at the skate park. But I was scared to do it on a jump box because I thought you had to do like a gainer. So I thought you had to jump forwards whilst doing it. I was scared to do it. So I tried it on the spine, but on the quarter pipe side of the spine. And my first ever attempt at a backflip was a backflip to fakie. And I, that then evolved into a flare. And I became the first scooter rider in the world to do a flare on a scooter back in 2003. And that's, so that's one of the most iconic moments. And I mean, the moment when I landed that flare was just amazing. It's, it still sticks in my mind to this day. I was at the park warehouse in Great Yarmouth rest in peace that skate park doesn't doesn't exist anymore but i remember all the other riders in the skate park the bmx's the skateboarders the inline skaters all stopped riding and this is the first time i'd ever really seen any sign of respect or support from other sports because i just thought they hated me because i'd just been bullied by them and they'd all stop riding they're all cheering me on to do this flare 
And I remember when I landed that flare, the skate park just erupted. It was one of the best moments of my life. And I've had so many moments like that since. You know, I did the first ever double backflip on a skewer in 2007. I did the first barrel roll on a skewer. I did lots of the first flare combos, flare tail whip, flare no hander. And then as my riding evolved, I joined Mad Gear and like the stunt scooter evolution, the stunt scooter era started. I, uh, I started doing crazier tricks, you know, flare to ice pick is one of the most iconic tricks that I'm probably known for, you know, and then grind to backflip where ramp works coming back to ramp works they built a specific ramp for me to do the world's first grind to backflip on a scooter and that's great isn't it you we're talking about ramp works that just previously i was just talking about how they had scooter only nights because they didn't allow scooters in a skate park and now we're talking about them specifically making a ramp shaped for me so a grind a ledge specifically shaped for me to do a world first and yeah i managed to do the grind to backflip and some of the attempts on that were <laughs> horrendous like we put these foam blocks down on the floor and i remember just like slipping out mid flip and just you know i think i landed probably on my head and luckily i landed it first try when we took away all the foam and everything the camera Press record, old Ricky behind the camera, press record, and I got it first try. And yeah, many other trip tricks, many other tricks that I've landed, like the caveman backflip, uh, backflip finger flip, that countless amounts, amazing tricks. Very proud of. What are some of your best memories? Firstly, there's too many to mention. I mean, they're just. I mean, I've been all over the world, every, like every part of the world, like with, with Mad Gear especially, you know, been to Dubai, I've been to China, I've been to Australia, I've been all over Europe in a double-decker tour bus. Like, you can't feel like any more of a celebrity than rocking up to a skate park in a giant tour bus with mad gear on the side and you're one of the superstars that walks out of it. I've had some of the best moments ever touring around the world and I'm forever thankful because some of the memories that I have, I, I talk to regular people about, you know, just people outside of the industry. And I, I honestly don't think they believe me a lot of the time because some of the memories I have, some of the moments, some of the crazy situations that I won't delve into, but some of the crazy situations that we've had, it's just like, it makes me laugh to this day. It's amazing, like, and that's all because of scoot riding, all because of scoot riding, that I've just got these memories that will forever make me smile. What was it like being part of the OG Mad Gear UK team? Yeah, I mean, the Mad Gear UK team was unquestionably one of the biggest influences in early scooter riding. Like, some iconic names in there. You got Rob Wasp, you got Dan Avery, um, Graham Kimball, Perry Grant, just to name a few. Jamie Hole as well. I mean, God, you can't forget that guy. Wow, nearly, or should I say Mohawk Kid, as he was known when I first saw him. The, the Mad UK team, we went all over. We went all over. We were every weekend going out and just touring constantly. Yeah, the, the, the level of activity that we were, were making was just in, on another level. No other scooter team could match that. We were going all over, riding fresh park ramps. You know, we had these portable ramp setups and we'd go around, we'd go in the middle of middle of town squares doing 
action sports shows, you know, scooter shows and just throwing down on these on these ramps that were well less than desirable let's say we were going into schools as well and on top of that we were going on these insane tours and doing on the road videos making cr crazy times and, and amazing memories where it wasn't just about scooter riding you know, we would go out and we just have fun and we just so happened be on our scooters as well most of the time and yeah we'd play pranks on each other we'd stay up late we would you know we would we would just go exploring in nature or swimming and we'd also go to skate parks and sign hundreds or thousands of autographs during the day and yeah it's just surreal really it's literally like the life of a megastar and we just lived in. It was one of the most iconic moments within scoot riding. And I was right there as the team manager and just living it. And I mean, I just, I feel honored to be a part of that because I know it's one of the best moments of my life and I really appreciate it. And if you don't know about them times in scoot riding, look them up search for on the road videos they're amazing search for old mad gear uk videos because we really really knew how to party tell us about the most iconic vehicle in scootering the mad van that thing wow that took us that took us all over i mean god I don't know how many miles we did on that, but that thing was amazing. I mean, it was terrible, but amazing at the same time. <laughs> it was horrible to drive, to be fair. But in the back, we had like countless amounts of speakers and subwoofers, and we'd turn up at places and just like start a, a scooter rave, and it'd have like a TV showing scooter clips, and had six seats. So I had three in the back and three in the front. And it was, yes, probably one of the most recognizable scooter vehicles worldwide. Everyone knows the Mad Van. And yeah, I mean, the memories that come out of that thing. Like, I even jumped it at one point. We, uh, we, uh, we got it airborne. <laughs> I don't know why Mad Gear let us have this thing. We, uh, we got it airborne going over a bridge. We got all four wheels off the, off the, off the road. Yeah, and car, I mean, wow, the amount of tours that we went on with with that thing was just insane. And yeah, I mean, nostalgia right there, amazing. In the face of challenges and setbacks, where did you find the drive to pursue your passion? That's a good question because it hasn't just been straightforward. You know, I, I have had a lot of challenges and setbacks. You know, it's one of the main ones that every, every scooter rider will face is injury. And there have been times where I've wanted to give up scooter riding because of injury, for example. But it, I tend to, it doesn't matter how much I go off course, it tends to always lead back to scooter riding. It's the thing that I'm good at. It's the thing that, I do love and I don't think a lot of people can say that they love their job and because this is my job as well I get paid to do it I make a living from scooter riding and yeah I I've faced all of the setbacks and the criticism and the hard times head on and you just get on with it and there, there will be times where it's not easy you know, like money, for example, we need money to survive and money hasn't always been great. So there are times where you think, oh, maybe I should go get a regular job and go do, you know, work in an office or something. But you take the highs with the lows and over my, over my career, I've I've had more highs than I have lows. And that's the important thing. 
and I, w I won't give up ski riding. I love it. And what I do now with the coaching side of things is fantastic, you know, teaching the next generation of kids and making a comfortable living out of it makes it all worthwhile. So what I will say is it's not always going to be easy, but work hard, keep that focus on what, what, where you want to get to and you will get there. Rider, judge, coach. Can you tell us about the path your career has taken over the years? Yeah, so you've summed up really. Rider, judge, coach. So I went from being one of the pioneers of the sport, you know, creating lots of the first tricks on a scooter, reaching the top of the sport, winning competitions, being an absolute megastar. <laughs> And then I went from that to judging. And I, I actually kind of quit competing pretty much in my prime of riding because I decided quite early on that I didn't really enjoy it much and that I wanted to focus on just enjoying riding because it can be very stressful. It's a lot of pressure on these riders, especially nowadays. And that led me into judging and I helped set up the ISA. I helped create the rule book for scooter riding and to create an official world championships. That led me into the whole judging side of things and I've judged world championships. I've judged competitions all over the world. And then I left the ISF, which was the ISA. I'm no longer part of that. And now I do coaching. And so it's like my third chapter, I've gone from riding to judging to coaching. And with coaching, it's amazing. I have my own company, Scooter Coaching, and I go all over. I go all over the UK in, in schools all over the UK. I go in a different school every single day, teaching kids about scooter riding. I do a motivational assembly, show them my tricks, do a nice big backflip off my ramps. And yeah, just teach kids how to ride scooters and get more kids onto scooters. And as well as that, I've been on cruise ships, going all over the world, teaching kids on cruise ships and in skate parks, I host events, and it's awesome. This is the most rewarding chapter of my scooter riding career by far. Nothing beats the look on a kid's face when they learn that new trick for the first time ever and you give them a high five and they're just stoked to be a part of that sport that you helped create. And I love it, it's the best. What qualities and values does the scooter community embrace? <clears throat> Something I always say is that scooter riders are decent people. And I, I won't just limit that to scooter riders. I think skate park users are decent people. I think it's a really good place to go. I know as a kid, all of my friends from school, they all ended up going down the wrong path. It was drugs and violence. And I won't go into details, but scooter riding took me down a better path. And I've met amazing people in the scooter community and in the skate park community that just have so many good values in life and aspirations and actually are doing something they love you know they have a passion for something and you know they're, they're they're quality people and that's why i have so many friends in the scooter industry you know you learn through scooter riding to be resilient because you do have to get yourself up off the floor time and time and time and time again to learn a new trick. And then when it comes to the real world, you have the same kind of stuff, you know, because the real world is tough. It's not always gonna be easy. There'll be loads of setbacks, but it's scooter riding that will help you through them setbacks because it's what we learn from scooter riding that shapes us as an amazing adult human being. And yeah, I mean, the confidence that you get from scooter riding as well. I think it's really good for building up confidence. There's, I've seen kids grow up 
shy, shy kids grow up into the most expressive adults ever, full of life and full of confidence through scoot riding. It teaches you so many amazing life skills that, you know, I always, I always say scoot riders become the best adults. They, they just, they just, they just excel in life because of what we learn from the skate park. You don't realize it at the time when you're in the skate park, crashing and getting back up or getting bullied or having tough times. You don't realize all the things that you're learning at that point are gonna help you later in life. And that's why I'm a strong advocate for scooter riding and skate park lifestyle in general. Tell us more about some of the friendships you've made over the years. So one of the one of the, one of the best friendships that I have from scoot riding has got to be with Ryan Williams. I mean, everyone knows Ryan Williams, surely, right? One of the biggest action sports stars in the world, and I just so happen to regard him as one of my best friends. And if you don't know, Ryan Williams was the first Mad Gear rider internationally. Um, he was one. He was the first Mad Gear Australia rider. I was the first Mad Gear UK rider and we went on so many tours together. Um, it would often just be me, Ryan and maybe some other riders, but it was always me and Ryan because we were like the two main guys for so many years. And so we went all over the world together. And to this day, I like, I'm still such good friends with him. I, you know, I constantly talk with him online and we'll share, you know, clips together. And he obviously works with Nitro Circus now. He's evolved into an action sports athlete. He focuses on his BMX as well as his scooter riding. And I work with Nitro Circus as well. I'm the scooter sport organizer for Nitro World Games. And so I know all of the guys from Nitro. I'm good friends with Travis Pastrana as well, one of the mega stars of action sports and we went to like a children's hospital all together and did amazing work there and yeah i i mean it's crazy that i'm friends with people who have millions of followers outside of scooter riding as well as inside of scooter riding and yeah i feel very feel very gifted to have to have that really how would you like to see scootering grow and evolve? So obviously it it has evolved so much over the years. You know, it's, it started in 1999. There was a handful of us riders, kids worldwide. And we all came together through a, a forum called Scooter Resource, where we all pulled together and got chatting and sharing photos and videos of us riding you know people from all over the globe and that community grew into maybe a hundred riders and then it was a thousand riders and then obviously in 2010 i think it was that year when the stunt scooters came out it just blew up it just blew up into this sport that you see now you see, I, I've seen it when it wasn't a sport. It was just a bunch of kids having fun on scooters and trying, trying to create something awesome. And now it's been created. But the next chapter is obviously the Olympics, in my opinion. If we can get scooter riding into the Olympics, that will be just the best thing to see. That's, that's like the mainstream tick right there, you know. If, Scooter riding can become an official Olympic sport. That'd be the best thing to see, just because I have seen it when it was nothing. And I mean, literally nothing, it didn't exist. So to see something that you've helped create go from nothing to an Olympic sport would be just one of the best feelings ever. How do you feel about the level of today's riding? I mean, just when you think the sport must start slowing down at some point with the level of innovation and progression, 
it just blows your mind again. Like there are kids like Yorbu, for example, doing triple overheads like in their sleep, you know, and there there are probably like a hundred riders now that can do double flares. How crazy is that? The level of riding in scooter riding is just it's just insane and i don't see it slowing down now I, I used to think it would slow down but i've learned that it just doesn't it just things get bigger people get more creative people find other ways to do tricks you know juzzy carter the one of the most creative guys in the sport of scooter riding grinding on his handlebars and doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things on his scooter. Tommy Dang doing like insane body varial combos. Uh, Jack Ward just with absolutely mind blowing tricks. He does nothing front, uh, double nothing front scooter flips. He, uh, he does, he flips his scooter in ways that you just wouldn't even think would be possible. And then obviously back to Ryan Williams, like Ryan Williams, just what he's unleashed with our Willie land, not just him, but for other riders as well, has taken scoot riding to the next level. Like Will Barlow, Reese Rogers are battling out for the first quadruple backflip on a scooter. And that's just insane to even say. And I mean, I think about some of the tricks that are gonna get done in the next few years and to say them and actually i'll say a couple now that i know will get done so i know a double backflip drop in will definitely get done at some point in the near future double backflip drop in will definitely get done quadruple backflip will get done triple flares have been done obviously jordan clark has done triple flare now but you'll be seeing triple flares in competition in at some point in the near future and yeah i think there is so much more potential for the sport of scooter riding it's exciting and i love to see it what do you appreciate most about the impact you've had on the scooter community yeah sometimes i forget how much impact i've had on the community until i see someone just go crazy when they meet me for example or i'll get like a really nice message through on instagram or something where i've helped change someone's life and i'm not just talking about like a minor change you know you're talking about kids who could have possibly gone into like drug addiction or something like that but scooter riding took them out of that dark place and i was the one who influenced them and that impact is just it's bigger than what i can even comprehend really and that's just that's just the stuff i know about there there would be kids out there that i've influenced that i will never ever know about and i just want to make a positive change i want to make a positive difference on kids and be a positive role model because that's the best thing I can do really is go out and just help these kids become better people in themselves. And I can do that through scooter riding. Would you say your journey's complete? I don't think your journey's ever complete, but I definitely can tell you that my journey is not complete now. I mean, I always think of my scooter career as chapters. I think that's the best way to uh, define it. And what I'm doing now with my scooter coaching is far from complete. I have huge aspirations for what I'm doing. And I want to just get scooters into more and more schools all over the country and all over the world, more skate parks, just more exposure for the sport. And yeah, I want to just blow up what I'm doing really. And there's no real limit to what I can do with scooter coaching. I mean, I've only just got started really. It's, uh, it's big things to come, that's for sure. Terry, thanks for taking the time to talk to us and give us the insight into the history of you 
and your riding career. Uh, just one final question. What advice would you give to any aspiring riders? I could give a lot of advice to riders because I think a lot of riders, a lot of kids, more specifically younger riders, they just want to be sponsored. And that's like their main goal is sponsorship. And I think when, when your main goal is to get sponsored, you'll fulfill that goal in two years or three years of scoot riding. Wow. You should aim for more than that, you know, because scoot riding is more than just getting sponsored and being a professional or being a world champion. It, you know, a lot of people say it's an art form and I think it is. You can express yourself, you can be creative and more importantly, you can create in incredible memories. And so I'd say focus more on just enjoying the moment. Every time you go to the skate park or you go to an event, or anything within the scooter industry just enjoy the moment create amazing memories because when you're older and your body decides that it can no longer flip a scooter upside down and whatnot you'll look back at these times and you'll really cherish them and so just enjoy what you're doing make the most of it and more importantly just just go out and enjoy riding your scooter.